A witness reports a strange object hovering in the night sky over Virginia. When the witness is a NASA engineer, well, you sit up and pay attention. The sighting remains unexplained for almost half a century. I mean, what was that thing? What was it? Can newly declassified NASA documents finally solve the mystery? <laughs> 6 p.m., January 27th, 1965. Hampton, Virginia. David Crimmins is an 11-year-old schoolboy driving home with his father. We were in the car, and we pulled into our driveway. The door was half open, and he stopped, and he was staring through the windshield. Dad said, go get the binoculars, because he did not want to take his eyes off it. It's a mile, a good mile away, it was flying. Definitely see the lights very clearly. They blinked in sequence. One, two, three, four, five. As Crimmins describes it, red and orange lights on what appears to him to be a rotating disc. And then it gets even more bizarre. This thing actually lands. In many ways, the Hampton incident is just another UFO sighting. But David's father is no ordinary witness. My father was a service engineer. He worked at Langley Air Force Base at NASA. He basically knew the exotic advanced equipment that NASA used, and he could get into it, figure it out, fix it, make it work. When you have a uh, NASA employee reporting a, a UFO, especially over a military or government installation, the government has to report it. The U.S. Air Force launches its own investigation into the Hampton incident. The Air Force put forth a theory that the object that was seen was actually an H-3 Sea King helicopter. You can see these at nighttime where the blade actually gives off some electric discharge. You can see the colors, like a laser, just going back and forth and back and forth. But the Air Force explanation doesn't fit with Cremens' witness report of a silent craft. This just doesn't add up. The fact that the Air Force says that it was an H-3 Sea King, first of all, the helicopter makes a ton of noise. We listened, you know, however hard you can listen, and uh, no, we couldn't hear anything. He said, in my mind, now I know for sure it's not a helicopter. Crimmins pushes the investigation further. After being interviewed by the Air Force, Crimmins actually gets in touch with NICAP. NICAP, the leading UFO investigation group at that time, opens an investigation. And this is when things get really interesting. NICAP investigators suggest the location of Crimmins' sighting could provide an explanation. In the vicinity of where these two witnesses had their sighting is Langley Air Force Base. Could there have been some secret testing there that would explain their sighting? The Air Force at that time was building what we called Project 1794. And this was their first attempt in building an actual flying saucer. At the time of the sighting, Project 1794 was designated top secret. But in October 2012, the Department of Defense released declassified documentation. According to the documents, the craft would have had a top speed of Mach 4 with a ceiling of over 100,000 feet. Theoretically, the flying saucer would have been able to perform the incredible maneuvers witnesses described. Most importantly, it would have been capable of a VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing. But evidence from another U.S. military flying saucer program suggests such a craft would have been hard to build. The military did build a prototype craft called the Avro Car, but it never moved beyond the point of being able to fly just a few feet into the air. The plug gets pulled on the Avro Car project in 1960. Well, that's five years earlier, so that can't be the explanation. For almost five decades, the Hampton incident remains unsolved. 
But in 2012, NICAP investigators uncover documents that could offer a new lead. Our driveway that we pulled into on Windmill Point faces straight across this place called Plumtree Island. Now, Plumtree Island was this very dark, scary place. It was government property. It used to be a bombing range, we were told. The documents reveal Plumtree Island was also the site of highly classified NASA spacecraft tests. In the mid-1960s, NASA would have been doing drop tests on the Gemini and Apollo spacecraft. Which involves lifting it up with some sort of crane or a helicopter and then dropping it down to test landing in water, crash landing on the Earth, parachute tests, things like that. Some of these tests were done in secret. I mean, remember, in all of this, America was still in the race to get to the moon first. But even if NASA was conducting secret drop tests at Plumtree Island, the spacecraft would not be capable of the maneuvers the UFO performed. OK, I mean, Plumtree Island would have been a fine place to do that, but this thing wasn't dropping. You know, it was, it was hovering. Surely NASA engineers would have seen a drop test before and wouldn't mistake the capsule for something truly unknown. 50 years on, David Crimmins is still searching for answers to the mystery that baffled his father. We all have memories that we can identify, you know, in very specifically and in vivid terms. That's one of them for me. We'll probably never know what those two saw. There are still a lot of unanswered questions here. <laughs>